I have the great pleasure of introducing American audiences to Christian Novak, a writer whose book, Dark Mother Earth, I just translated and it came out in January with Amazon Crossing. So here is Christian in Croatia. And before we start, I just want to say that on March 22nd, just a few weeks ago, actually three weeks ago today, there was a pretty bad earthquake in Zagreb, especially hit hard the center of town, town right, right in the middle of middle everybody, of everybody. With the coronavirus. And it was uh, a great shock to people. And, and although it's not what we're going to talk about today, I did want to mention it. So, Christian, uh, could you talk a little bit about Dark Mother Earth? Say what it's about as a novel and, uh, and how you describe your use of language in particular in the novel. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm gonna um, try to um, to make it work in English, but uh, Ellen, you uh, please please do help uh, when when I get stuck. Um, well, uh, how to describe it in um, in a few words? Um, well, the story is set in the eve of the Balkan Wars uh, in the 90s. Uh, in a small Croatian village in the far north, and there's this uh, five-year-old boy whose uh, father passed away uh, recently, and he's unable to cope with the loss, so he escapes in his own kind of fantasy world. Um, and uh, at the same time, the village is haunted by a series of unexplained uh, suicides. Uh, and so slowly mass paranoia takes over, and the line between reality and fantasy blurs for everyone, not, not just for the kid. Um, uh, pushing the boy actually to relive the, the tragedy he was running away from all along. And uh, I think the, the core of the story is a friendship between the boy and an isolated and abused child, um, which gets destroyed and betrayed because both of them are desperately trying to belong to the community. Um, and the novel is to, written mostly, uh, the original is written mostly in Croatian standard, but the dialogues are written in the dialect spoken in the far north of, of Croatia. I don't know if um, if uh, if I did good. <laughs> no, no, I, I I do want to talk a little bit about the dialect. Of course, I was the translator who dealt with translating the dialect. But what I found so interesting about your use of dialect, Christian, is that is that this is a runaway bestseller. Your novel it just became it's. I think just recently, didn't you get an award for the most borrowed book in any library in Croatia? It's just been hugely popular. And for those of you who don't know much about the Croatian language, Croatian has several very distinct dialects within it, and they are not mutually intelligible. So somebody from Dalmatia really wouldn't be able to understand this dialect easily. And yet they read this book with great enthusiasm. And I know people from Bosnia and Serbia who also read it with great enthusiasm. And I found that fascinating. That, and I think it speaks to how compelling the story is because the story really carries a reader along and then you learn the dialect as you go so that by the end of the novel, you really do sort of understand what people are saying, even if you didn't at the beginning. I was fascinated by that. Uh, and I wondered, in your thinking, what role does dialect play in fiction? I mean, it, it's clearly playing some sort of a role here and I'd really be interested to hear you talk about that um, yes it, it, it was quite a, a risky business with with the dialect uh, with the, with the dialogues and in, in, in the dialect in, in the novel and uh, I still can't believe uh, my luck with the success uh, it made uh, since this di this particular dialect is actually of the lowest prestige I think in Croatia it's often you know uh, linked to uneducated people backward villagers uh, countryside, um, and so on. And so there was this risk that nobody would read the story, but it turned out uh, it, it was a huge success, not only in Croatia, but in all of ex-Yugoslavia so far. And uh, a lot of uh, people enjoy the use of, of this risky dialect. For me, when I go back to the creative process, um, there was actually no other way. I could have done it. Uh, I wouldn't believe my own writing if the characters spoke in the standard Croatian language. Uh, and since I put everything that has the most emotional weight uh, into these dialogues, uh, it turns out that the dialect is actually the emotional core of the story. 
Um, but it wasn't uh, kind of uh, my, my writer's strategy. It, it turned out to be this way uh, during this uh, four years um, uh, writing process. So uh, I, I'm lucky it turned out to, to, be, to be this way. Yeah. So in a way, the dialect takes one into the emotional life of the characters. It, it brings it sort of home to something uh, authentic because it's coming. Well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I, I certainly had, had issues to deal with with the dialect. <laughs> um, so, so I know uh, because I've been to see the play that a play was made based on, on this, although you didn't adapt the text to the play. Did you, somebody else did? Um, or did you work with one or? Yes, I was kind of, um, you know, um, an advisory function. But, but you've been very involved, way back. You've been very involved in preparatory work for a film that is being made from the novel. And so I was interested in these adaptations, both the theater and the and the film, and what you learned about your own novel mm -hmm. working on it, because I think it's a issue. In issue a way, they're all translations too. Yes, uh, it, it was uh, totally fascinating for me. Um, for, for one thing, to, to hear uh, your own words uh, spoken out loud on the, on the, on the theater stage, it's, for, it's, it's just an amazing feeling, you know? Uh, but uh, to go back to the process, I knew from the start that I had to be loose and not be compulsive as a writer about my work that's being adapted and just let the, you know, enthusiastic theater people to do what they do best. Um, and I knew that every adaptation is uh, kind of a betrayal of the original, uh, but I was lucky that for me, it was a sweet one, you know? Um, and thanks to the people who worked hard on the adaptation, it, ha it, it happened to be so. And um, one, one thing I, I learned is that a story is kind of fit to be ad adapted for stage or screen if it has an, um, I don't know if, if, if you say it so, uh, archetypical backbone. Mm -hmm. okay. If it has um, an archetype, in the, in the narrative, something that would, um, you know, grip a caveman as much as a person in the 21st century. If it has such a universal, you know, um, um, human relationship, then it is fit to be adapted in, into other media. Uh, and that is actually precisely what I search for whenever I write. When, when I wrote uh, Dark Mother Earth, uh, although I wasn't aware of it, I was actually searching for an for an archetype within the the uh, the relationship between these two kids that that are being betrayed. So that's one thing I learned. But uh, it was actually a, a great learning proce process so far. Oh, the movie, yeah. yeah. It requires a lot of flexibility. You've always got to be figuring out how best to convey whatever it is you feel is essential to the work. Yes, and uh, what I think is essential is not um, necessarily what the director thinks is <laughs> <it's> essential. <laughs> but um, at this point, you have to, you know, let go <laughs> and look forward for, for, to a sweet betrayal. <laughs> Okay, well, with the way we set this up, Christiana and I, I put together some questions for him and he put together some questions for me. So I'll hand it off to you, Christiane, for your questions, whatever you'd like to ask me. Okay, I have several for you. I, I have a hundred questions for you, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, look, I, I always thought of uh, literary translation as, as a creative process and of uh, literary translators as people who cannot do their work uh, properly without some and uh, you've translated uh, so far numerous uh, large narratives and I guess you don't find all parts of a novel for example equally good so did you ever struggle with the urge to make the translation better than the original or do you just say oh well the author wrote this part totally bad and my translation should reflect that <laughs> well almost always the <laughs> translations that I work on are of living authors and so usually what I will do if I have a question about something that I'm not clear on is just come to the author and say, I'm not clear on this. Could you help me understand it? And sometimes what that means is that the prose wasn't quite clear enough in that place and the author had to make some changes. And I have had situations where 
the author has gone back and changed the original as a result of the fact that I've kind of brought a magnifying glass to that little piece of prose that wasn't quite clear uh, or just simply allowed me to make clearer or something that wasn't as clear in the original. But I wouldn't do that without consult consult consulting with the author. And I would do the consultation with the assumption that the author and I would make it better rather than that I would actually produce bad prose. I I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever actually managed to do that. I, I mean, maybe what I have produced is bad prose, but I certainly not deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's, um, I, I agree, because the, the process in itself for the author is, is kind of, uh, you know, humbling. Uh, at times, because you get somehow confronted with your own limitations as, as a writer. Um, so, uh, uh, Ellen, I guess for, for some time now, you're in a position where you can choose at least a part of your future projects. Um, and I wonder what, what are the criteria for you? What, what makes you say, OK, I'll do this one and not that one? And in addition, uh, while you choose, are you aware of, that you function also as a bridge between uh, the English language readership and the cultures and languages of your expertise, and is it a burden for you? Well, that's that's a lot of questions all in one, but I will say that, interestingly, I mean, back in the day when I started out as a translator, I chose some authors and some books that I really admired, and I approached the authors and I asked, may I translate your book? And if they allowed me to, then I did. And that was a matter of my choice. And then I would go and uh, find a publisher and 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 proceed that way. What happens now is quite different. What happens now is I have my authors, and I'm saying that because Christian and I just a few months ago were part of a panel of two authors and two translators, and the panel was called Translators and Their Authors. And so I have my authors now, and whether I like their books or not, they <laughs> <laughs> they expect me or they hope that I will continue translating their work, and I generally do. Uh, once I've sort of started a relationship, I've kind of established a set of stylistic understandings and voice and so forth with, with an author's writing, then, then that make, it's an investment of my time that pays off over time in terms of working on their work longer uh, going over a period of time. So I, I, I'd say that's what often defines it is that someone I've already worked with comes to me. Also publishers that I've already worked with come to me and say, we have somebody, would you be interested? And I don't always take things. I, a lot of times it's not even an issue of the quality of the work so much as my own time that I, that I have time and I have to be careful with it. And then there's always the question of burnout too, which I have to be careful with when I have a lot of work. I, I need to pull back a little bit and, and start reading other people's translations and novels and things and, and, and do a little less translating for a while to mm -hmm. my own, uh, my fresh, my own voice as a translator. And in terms of, and I think this is probably going to have to end our conversation because we're coming up on our 15 minutes, but, um, well, not, not quite. We still got a minute and a half there. Um, as far as, yes, of course, I think anybody translating into English is aware that small languages, I don't know, Icelandic or Catalan, because this is not Jordi, or, or other languages of limited diffusion often take the English translation of a book and translate it into their language. <laughs> In, in a relay arrangement. And so it's not just building bridges in the old worn cliche of translation. It's actually, there's that added responsibility of providing a text that somebody may need to work from into another language. And uh, yes, I'm aware of that, of course. It all depends on how well the book actually does once it's published. I mean, it may just, you know, sort of disappear. Sometimes that happens. Uh, and then I'm not much of a bridge <laughs> if that happens. But if a book is successful and, and reaches readers, um, yeah, I mean, the thing, I guess it's not so much a burden as a responsibility. And I always feel very responsible and humbled by that responsibility and want to convey as fully as possible uh, all that I see going on in the prose. And I may miss things, of course, people miss things, but but I do, I want to bring the richness of a, of a work of writing to an audience. Uh, and, and I think, 
I think that's our 15 minutes. So maybe, cool. <laughs> maybe flew by. I know it flew by, but it's a great pleasure. And thank you so much for being willing to, uh, to have this conversation with me from the United States to Croatia. Much appreciated, Christian.